Please welcome to the stage Dr. Catherine Zahn. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. Thank you so much for being here on this uh, very, very special and I think auspicious day. Uh, thanks to all of the CAMH staff members, donors, volunteers, supporters, and board members who have joined us today. I'll begin by recognizing that CAMH has the honor of being situated on lands that have been occupied by First Nations for millennia. Toronto is part of the traditional territories of the ancient St. Lawrence Iroquoians, the Huron Wyandat Nation, and the Seneca of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Today's land guardians are the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, and this Queen Street site is the historical place of camping and holding council for the Mississaugas. CAMH is committed to reconciliation as we create new relationships and partnerships with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, sharing this land and protecting it for future generations. Thank you. Now in 2016, the Ontario Ombudsman's Office released a report about the care and treatment of the more than 60,000 adults in Ontario with developmental disabilities. A report called Nowhere to Turn, which I know is familiar to many of you here today. In addition to detailing the litany of injustices visited upon people with neurodevelopmental de disabilities in our province, the report describes a society that fails to provide equitable care and supports for people with the experience of both developmental disability and a mental illness. In my own neurologic practice, I had the experience of caring for individuals with neurodevelopmental disabilities along with their families. I witnessed their struggles with the difficult reality. I recognized their expressions of defeat in the face of health, education, and social support systems that were bereft of solutions. And in some ways, having no solutions myself, I left them and their aging parents to a deeper isolation. I'd like to read a short excerpt from the Ombudsman's report about the legacy of developmental services in Ontario that highlights the importance of today. The report states that in the 1800s, from a medical and social standpoint, there was little distinction in the treatment of those with intellectual and mental health conditions. In the early part of that century, adults with mental and developmental disabilities who could not be cared for in their family homes often found themselves housed in jails. In 1841, Ontario opened its first asylum for these individuals, initially located at the old York Jail in Toronto, but eventually moving to 999 Queen Street. 999 is, of course, the original address for the spot upon which we stand. And today, while there's been some progress, people with developmental disabilities are at risk for more recent hospitalization, under-treatment when it comes to psychotherapy and social supports, and yet over-treatment with medications as a last resort. The services and supports that exist for those with these disabilities, including mental health care, are too few, too slow to activate, poorly standardized and oversubscribed. A patchwork of small possibility leaves families frustrated and exhausted. And I'm sure we can do so much better. At CAMH, we focus on knowledge creation through research and discovery, on knowledge exchange through training and education, and on knowledge translation that brings our research to real people in the real world for real impact. As of today, we accelerate that discovery and innovation, that education and knowledge translation. Because today, I'm happy to announce that thanks to a $10.4 million donation from our champions at the Israeli Foundation, CAMH is now home to the Israeli Center for Neurodevelopmental Disabilities and Mental Health. Mm -hmm. 
The center will create new knowledge about the mental health of adults with neurodevelopmental disabilities. Our scientists and educators will use that new information to improve training for caregivers, ignite clinical innovation, and advance care. Equally exciting, I'm very pleased to announce that the brilliant, accomplished, and deeply dedicated Dr. Yonolansky has been selected as the inaugural director of the Israeli Center. Yona, congratulations. A clinician scientist in CAMH's adult neurodevelopmental services, Yona's made it her life's mission to pursue research and knowledge creation in, on the mental health needs of individuals with neurodevelopmental disabilities. She's an ardent advocate for the meaningful and inclusive change that will improve the physical and mental health of these individuals. As head of the new center, Yona will have the opportunity to advance her work and that of her colleagues in a whole new way. Congratulations, Yona. And lastly, to the Israeli family, especially my great colleague and friend, Naomi, what a powerful message you're sending to the world today, a message about the human and social value of people with disabilities. Through your breathtaking generosity, you've created new expectations. You've set the bar very high through a center that will, in the end, advance the human, civil, and healthcare rights of these individuals on the very ground where they were stolen. Thank you again for partnering with CAMH to demand justice. Thank you. And with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Ian Brown, who's the moderator of our panel discussion today. It's a discussion about adults with dual diagnosis. Ian is many things. But many of you will know him as a columnist for the Globe and Mail and the author of the book Boy in the Moon, an award-winning memoir about his son's intellectual disability. And I'll now turn it over to Ian to introduce the panelists. Thank you. This is when the dancing begins. Um, it's a, a thank you very much. Um, it's and good morning. It's a huge. Um, honor to be here to help uh, kick off a discussion uh, and we all hope it will be a continuing uh, discussion uh, about the mental health needs of adults with uh, neurodevelopmental disabilities. We talk a lot about uh, prevention and diagnosis and treatment and services and funding, but we seldom talk about all those issues within the uh, larger a context of a real community and real uh, lives and how people with neurodevelopmental disabilities can actually live meaningful, uh, continuing and contributing lives and have their needs met at the same time. So I'm going to kick this off right away. Um, the people who are going to start this conversation are sitting to my left. This is probably all very obvious to you by now. Um, <laughs> Um, to begin with, sorry, uh, Naomi, <clears throat> excuse me, Naomi Azrieli uh, is a chair and chief executive officer of the Azrieli Foundation, which under her guidance since 2002 has become the largest public foundation in Canada and one of the largest in Israel. She is the strategist behind any number uh, of initiatives, including the Azrieli a neurodevelopmental Research Program, CIFAR, Azrieli Global Scholars, the Azrieli Fellows Program, and the Holocaust Survivor Memoirs Program, of which she is both publisher and senior editor. She's the president of CanPro Investments and a director of the Azrieli Group, a publicly traded real estate company. She is also the chair of, of the Brain Canada Foundation. She holds a Doctor of Philosophy from Oxford, many other degrees, and was awarded France's uh, Légion d'honneur in uh, 2013. But even more to her credit, 
She was born in Montreal. <laughs> and even more to her credit, she now resides in Toronto with her husband and three children. Give her a hand, please. Yona Lunsky received her PhD in clinical psychology at Ohio State University and the Nysonger Center, which focuses on neurodevelopmental disabilities. She joined CAMH as a psychologist 16 years ago. She is now a senior scientist at CAMH and director of the Healthcare Access Research and Developmental Disabilities Program. Uh, she's a professor and a developmental disabilities lead in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. Toronto. She's an adjunct scientist at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. Uh, her research focuses on the mental health needs of individuals with neurodevelopmental disabilities as well as on their families. Uh, she works closely with hospital, uh, hospitals and community-based colleagues to design approaches that are uh, that will better meet uh, those needs. She also, uh, and this is important, has a sister with a developmental disability, uh, a lived experience that has guided not just her work, but her entire life. And last but certainly not least, Daniel Sherstrom is a much sought after speaker and workshop facilitator whose insightful and I have to say very, very funny uh, presentations on autism have inspired thousands of people at universities, at hospitals, uh, and in autism organizations since 2005. He approaches autism uh, not as a defect, uh, or as a mental illness, or as a catastrophe, or even as a disorder. Uh, he prefers to accept uh, the autistic experience as human experience and valuable in and of itself. Uh, he has an honors degree in communications. Uh, he has 10 nephews and nieces, all of whom are devoted to him. Uh, and he is uh, uh, getting his uh, postgraduate certificate in positive psychology. Please give him a big hand. I want to jump right in, if that's, if that's okay. Um, and Daniel, I'm going to start with you. Uh, let's define the problem. What are the challenges that individuals with neurodevelopmental disabilities uh, and mental illness uh, face in accessing appropriate care that would let them live normal lives? Sure, absolutely. So um, at its core, Autism is what's called a social communication disorder. And that can be a big er barrier to accessing services for people with developmental disabilities of any type. Uh, if you cannot say what you need, if, if you cannot approach the right people for help, or if you have difficulty finding the right words to advocate for yourself when your needs are misunderstood or, or minimized or catastrophized, then the prospect of seeking help can be very aversive and overwhelming. Uh, I hope that the communication and other challenges in autism and uh, other developmental diagnoses are considered when trying to help get us supports. Uh, so now, uh, now that I've shared that, I do want to actually say a little bit about my personal lived experience uh, finding mental health services as an adult. So, so first I want to uh, address the misconception that autism is a mental illness. It, it's, it's really not. Now, agreed, a lot of us do have things like anxiety and depression, but why wouldn't we? Like many people on the spectrum, I, I feel as though I was born into a world where the speed and volume of the learning uh, combined with the sensory and the social demands are too much to cope with at some times. I, I grew up not understanding things like social cues and always seemed out of step with what was going on around me. Social anxiety creeped up on me and it kind of broke into a jog around middle school. And I just sort of carried around this pervasive sense of being judged all the time. And you know what? Truthfully, I was. Consider that I had the experience of being corrected by everyone in, in every setting at every opportunity, even by people who are being nice. 
and I grew to believe that all my basic instincts were wrong. So even when, I, when things were said with love or the, the best of intentions, uh, these people's corrections confirmed for me that, that I was broken or not capable. And with strong family support, I soldiered on. Uh, when I became an adult, I began to experience depression along with the anxiety. And that's when the lack of service really hit home. Adult psychiatrists who know about autism are few and far between. And those who do, many of them have way too many patients and aren't taking more. Provin provincial health care doesn't cover psychologists, social workers, occupational therapists, the professionals who tend to know us best. And so if I needed help to cope, there was really not much available. Uh, my mom, who was single at the time, used her savings to pay for what visits to psychiatrists and things that she could, but, and they were very helpful, but you know, they cost six times her, average, her hourly salary. And in the 10 years since I've transitioned to adult services, we've continued to look for government support, but have found little. And I'll be honest, even if there was help out there, in those times when anxiety is the boss of me or, or when de depression is suffocating, I have a lot of difficulty finding help on my own. I, I don't feel in those moments that anything could help. I, I feel hopeless when it gets that bad. So that brings us back to the original question. Uh, for some people, accessing mental health services will require a strong advocate, uh, some pe someone who can help us to connect with those services when we're immobilized with self-doubt. Like many children with autism, my, my mother is on the 40-year uh, parenting plan. Love you. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm really grateful for today's announcement. Uh, this, this gift from the Israeli Foundation is so necessary because so many adults with autism suffer with mental health challenges due to their life experiences. There's no, contrary to popular belief, there's no off switch to these challenges when we turn 18. In fact, they usually get worse as life expectations increase. And yet, as few supports as there are when we're kids, there's almost nothing for adults. So I just think this is so amazing. Yeah. I have to say that as a bystander, as the father uh, of uh, someone with uh, some difficulties, um, that that's very true. And uh, in school, this notion of finding service, never mind uh, normalizing and making people see how normal these, these, this, these lives are. But once you become an adult, it's like falling off a cliff. So, Yona, just how difficult is it today for, for adults and their, their families to navigate all these swamps. I mean, there's the swamp of finding the service, there's the, there's the feeling of helplessness, there's the other people who don't understand what's going on. It, it's, I have to say, it almost feels insurmountable at times. Yeah, and certainly I think some families will say that it does feel insurmountable, and I think some individuals who are trying to get help themselves will also feel a bit beaten, I think, that it's... Uh, you know, the, the work that I've done, you know, I, sometimes I look at the whole province, right? So we study, like, what's going on across 65,000 people? What services are they getting? But that doesn't tell us the story, I think, or the experience of what it's like, you know, to not be able to find the service when you need it, um, to present your whole story and then kind of be told, well, I'm really sorry, but I don't know how to do that. You know, you, you, you'd have to go somewhere else. Like, it's, it's all well and good if there is this somewhere else, you know, that you can go to, and there are all the services that you need. But the reality is that, that that's not there for people. Um, you know, we, we did one study uh, with uh, uh, Jonathan Weiss and I did a study looking at, at parents and their ability to access help. And we compared parents who were in crisis and their experience when they had kids versus parents who had adult children. And maybe the, the most important finding from that study, parents of kids talked about how it's hard to know where to go to get services. It's a little bit overwhelming. I was embarrassed. I was maybe a bit ashamed. I didn't want to you know, talk about it. So just sort of that, that, that reticence to get the services that they needed. But the, the parents of adults talked about, actually, I don't get services because I did that before, and it, it didn't go well. You know, It wasn't a pretty picture. It didn't go right. 
And, and when, when, whether it's someone who has a disability or it's a family who just feels that sense of being kind of beaten, you know, they may not get the help when they need it because they just, they're done, right? So we have to find a way not only to make sure we give people the services that they need, but that they know that, you know, mental health care is, is something that we recognize is for them too. Uh, and it's not going to be another experience of sort of being, I guess, refused kind mm -hmm. of the services and the help they need. Mm -hmm. um, Naomi, another aspect of this whole problem is this notion that this population is frequently on the receiving end of help, that, you know, they're, they're already uh, taking a lot of resources. That has not been your, your experience. Yeah, not at all. Not at all. In fact, just to, to reiterate, there are basically no services, um, and in particular, no services that combine the type of comprehensive care that is necessary for this population. When you have um, a dual diagnosis, so you're dealing with a developmental disability, but also a mental health issue, and sometimes very challenging behaviors, um, you, can, you, you face a system which is filled with silos, and you can reach out in one place and maybe have a terrible experience, as Yana said, and reach out another and possibly have a good experience then, but it doesn't cover what you need. So you're constantly running after some kind of sense of being supported, and there's no sense for adults. You use the um, expression falling off a cliff. It's, I think this is the most vulnerable population in our healthcare system because you can get to a certain point and then you drop. There's, there's nothing available. Um, and I think that um, this notion of offering a comprehensive response, this, uh, this attempt now with what we're doing to train um, professionals so that they will recognize what they see in front of them um, and be able to then bring to bear more than one discipline. Um, I think that's, that's really the key. Let me, let me stay with, with you for a moment. So w w that's the problem. So what's the first thing that needs to change? How do, we, how do we get beyond this kind of antiquated notion of patient-centered care and, and move into something more organic? And... Yeah, although in a sense it is patient-centered care. I think that I, uh, it, it's precisely that, whereas I think the approach until now has been... Um, how can I put it, institution-centered, you know, the, the provider, provider-centered care. In this case, we want to look at the patient, the client, the person, as a person, first of all, because it becomes, it, it, what you see in my lived experience frequently is that you're not seen as a person. Um, I, I made a, a, an analogy the other day to, um, when you are in a uh, when you're in a hospital gown versus when you're in a business suit, you have a different feeling. People might approach you differently. In this case, I think the um, these individuals are often approached as la uh, somehow lacking, somehow scary, definitely. So there's a wall that goes up also between the even the great healthcare providers aren't always sure what to do. Um, so I think actually patient-centered care or person-centered care that begins with the person and what they need and giving them what they need, that is actually the key. Yona, we've talked about the, these gaps in the system, but people do go through those gaps. I mean, they get lost in the system. Can they be found and, you know, fished out of, uh, out of that basement and... and and yeah. helped. There's, there's probably two approaches, right? So there's the approach of, you know, when someone's really at the worst and they're in the basement and we fish them out, then we can do some really intensive work with them and ideally with their family and try to bring them back up, right? That's one way to do it. So in our healthcare system, it might be that, you know, they have a difficulty finding uh, someone through maybe trying to see their family doctor and seeing what's available. There's wait lists for things. Things get worse at home. They end up going to the emergency department. Uh, there isn't a whole lot that can be done. They get sent back home. They go again. Um, maybe eventually they have a short admission. Maybe after several short admissions, they have a very long admission. And it's clear that they can't go home, you know, that they need something different. But then that something's not there. So yeah, that's when we fish them out of the basement. 
But I think we have to be investing more of our time in reaching them much earlier in that process. You know, it's a very different kind of work that we do as clinicians. I mean, you talk about clinicians kind of feeling they don't necessarily know what to do. I don't know what to do in that situation of the person in the basement that I have to fish them out either. Like, that's a really, really difficult situation. But I do know what to do if I could have done that work much earlier. And so I think, you know, working really hard to make sure we can engage with people proactively when they need help is more inviting and more um, exciting um, and is, is a way to engage healthcare professionals. This is part of our job, right? This is part of what we can do. Um, so I, I would emphasize less how we fish them out and more how we try to support people, I think, earlier in their trajectory. I, I, wanna, I actually want to speak to that from the perspective of the experience of families. Because we talk about the system and what is required in the system, but the first level of care and the first level of support comes with families. And families aren't being supported either. I think that the experience of a family with a child with a developmental disability and then a challenging behavior or mental health issue is this normality of constant worry. Constant worry. It doesn't go away. It's constant anxiety. And it becomes the backdrop to everything. And at some point, that kind of stress on a family also plays a role in, in the type of support um, they can give to the person, and then you and and then you interact with the system. So, c intervening before to support the families at an earlier stage um, seems to me the first step. And we've mostly been talking about urban areas, but the 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 gap, the difference between an urban and a rural area, and the services available is just that goes beyond contemplation. I mean, yeah. Being in a city like Toronto. You, we have the best of everything. I mean, we have Camp H. It's fabulous. But uh, I think the, the disparity in, in rural areas, um, you know, we say there's nothing, there's less than nothing um, uh, outside of the urban areas. Yeah. So, so now I, I want to talk to, to turn to what, what's practical and, and, and what can be done about, about some of this stuff, um, particularly Maybe we could start it. How do you how do you change the situation in a way that this population, uh, which has very little political value uh, in the political world, how do we change it so that that population is no longer invisible and forgotten? And I, I want to turn to you because I, if this were an ideal world, okay, if it were always like this with nice people around. We've all had coffee, you know. Please never leave. Yeah, exactly. If it were an ideal world, what, what, in that ideal world, what will have changed for, for you? Uh, well, well, first I want to say I totally agree with, uh, with Naomi and Yana on the fact that we need to get on supports for families and for the individuals uh, earlier. So we, we know that family doctors usually only get uh, brief training in med school around developmental disabilities. Uh, so so let's, enhance, let's enhance that training and give, give them more intensive training in, in their med school uh, on developmental disabilities and autism, Down syndrome, all that kind of thing. Um, and especially for autism, because one in 68 people these days are diagnosed with autism. Uh, so I think that's very important. Uh, also, adults with autism, as I said, we need to get them uh, service navigators who can, who can help them through that system of support that they may find overwhelming and challenging. Um, one, one tidbit that a lot of people don't know about autism uh, is that our socio-emotional age is about a third behind our biological age. So if someone, someone turns 18, uh, but in many cases, they have the emotional development of a 12-year-old. Uh, so, so they particularly need these, these services and for people to, uh, to understand them. We need more mental health services opened up for an adult with a developmental disability. And we also need more community education around things like sensory issues because things like bright lights and loud noises and all that kind of thing, that's, that's something that can set a lot of people off. Uh, as well as the social communication challenges of autism, because people don't understand social cues, so they, they 
mess up in conversation or they have trouble starting relationships and that can cause wear on mental health as well. Uh, so we need, we need things that can address those as well. And that way we can address the, the root of the problem. Mm. Um, uh, Naomi, do you, at the national and international level, do you see hope, things that give you hope? That, do you see big changes in the way people are perceiving this community of people? Well, I see hope because we're all here today. Um, I, think, I think CAMH is on the leading edge of this. Um, I, I don't see a lot nationally and internationally, unfortunately. Um, I think that this is, this is actually groundbreaking, uh, what is being proposed for, for this center. Um, that being said, I think um, it's easy with this population to, if you're not directly involved with it, to just, or sometimes even if you are direct, directly involved, to throw up your hands and say, nothing can be done. You kind of build like an emotional callus to this, and you, you, you're, there's distance, and you, you, can't, uh, you can't engage with it. Uh, and you say, oh, well, you know, nothing to do. Oh, that's the health system. Oh, you know, maybe someone will throw more money at it or someone will do something. Um, and that is actually part of the problem now. That's something to be, to be fought against because there is hope. You know, one of the things that Yona and the many uh, amazing researchers here at CAMH and in Toronto in general and in, and in Canada um, have shown is that there is hope. There are, with the right supports, the right training, the right, with enough research, investing in good people, we can make a difference to the, li to, to the lives of these people. And every single individual, no matter what their capacity deserves to live a life of dignity, a life supported. And that's, that's what we have to keep in mind. And the hope is with this kind of initiative, with the kind of work that Yon is doing, uh, we'll get there. So I think, um, you know, it's not only fighting the system, it's also fighting the perception that there's no hope. There's fighting the perception that there's nothing anyone can do, so whatever, and move on to the next thing. Um, don't move on to the next thing. This is the thing. Mm -hmm. This is what we have to do. Yona, <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, let's end with you, if you don't mind. You now have this incredible uh, gift from the Azraeli Foundation. Any spending plans? <laughs> <laughs> um, it really is that, you know, it's, I was thinking about that this morning, you know, is it a, is it a spark? Is it a, is it a kind of glue maybe that's going to allow us to bring different kinds of things together? We're doing, I mean, there's, there's incredible people actually in the audience in the room right here who are doing amazing work, you know, whether it's clinicians who work in the um, adult neurodevelopmental service or clinicians who are working in other parts of CAMH or some of the families that are here, including my family, um, or uh, you know, people who are, who are working in policy, people who are doing research in other institutions. So we're all doing little bits of work, but we never really get to call it you know, research and education and, and force driving forward adults, neurodevelopmental disabilities, mental health. So I think this kind of brings it together uh, and I think people can be excited by that. Um, you know, when I, I ask every year when I, when I um, teach the psychiatry residents, I always kind of go around at the beginning of the seminar and say, you know, who here has had any experience with people with developmental disabilities, personal, uh, you know, clinic settings, whatever. And 15 years ago when I asked that question, it was dead silent, you know. But uh, people who are coming into training now have grown up in a different community than I grew up in right, where um, kids with disabilities were part of their neighborhood, part of their school, um, part of their class, their, their friends, their families, they were living at home with them and not, you know, in an institutional setting somewhere else. So I think people think differently now, young people, and those are the people we're going to be training, right? Those are the people who are providing the future care. We, we can do as much work as we can with people who are providing care right now, and we should continue to do that work, but we have this opportunity to reach this next generation of people to provide care differently. And, and I think the other thing we've learned that's so important is that we can't do that work by ourselves. So I think like 
everyone heard Daniel talk about his experience. And I, I could have tried to have said that, but I wouldn't have said it half as eloquently. And also, that's not my experience. It's Daniel's experience. So I think when we do our research, when we do our teaching, to make sure that we're really engaging and working together as a community, it's not something we're doing for them, right? It's something we're doing together. Uh, and I think we're, we're at a stage now where we're ready to do that kind of work and focus on this issue. And I, that's exciting. That wraps up the panel, as they say, in a ribbon. Uh, thank you very much. Will you give another hand to our panelists for doing a great job? And thank you for coming. I'm, I'm pleased to um, uh, be able to welcome longtime CAMH supporter and mental health advocate Michael McCain to say a few final words. Thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're two months into 2018 uh, as of February, and it's already a banner year for mental health in Canada. This morning's discussion very powerfully conveys uh, what all of us in the room know that mental illness looks different for every person. Uh, every journey is unique and we have a population of people whose unique needs uh, haven't historically been recognized, prioritized, uh, or addressed. It's clear that as a country we need to do better and thanks to this morning's announcement uh, of the Azraeli Center for Neurodevelopment Disabilities and Mental Health, uh, we can and we will. The Azraeli Foundation has been a trailblazer, uh, a trailblazer in supporting scientific and medical research. And Naomi, hearing you speak today, we're simply moved by what your family's done and your foundation's motivation to fuel innovation and lead change. I can't tell you how inspiring that is. On a very personal level, I am proud to say that the permanent home of the Azraeli Center for Neurodevelopment Disabilities and Mental Health will be in the McCain Complex Care and Recovery Center. <laughs> and that's an incredible honor for our family. <laughs> Simply to be associated in, and affiliated in some tiny little way with what you've done is an incredible honor. Today's announcement is actually the second milestone that we've recently celebrated with the Azraeli Foundation. Uh, just this past November, we announced the establishment of the Azraeli Center for Neuroradiochemistry. They've generously invested a total of $21.5 million. Can you believe that? $21.5 <laughs> in helping us to unlock the mysteries of the brain and advance care and understanding for which we could not be more grateful. Thank you. On behalf of all of CAMH, uh, our deepest thanks to the Azraeli Foundation and to those uh, who have waited so long for something like the Azraeli, Azraeli Center for Neurodevelopment, Disabilities and Mental Health. Thank you for your patience. We're going to do better for you. Together, we're creating a brighter future for all Canadians living with mental illness. I want to thank you for coming today. This is a huge milestone and a great gift to the future. Thank you.